afternoon, everyone. I just got held back. I was <laughs> that keen to get on. Wait for the music, I was told. Thank you, Genevieve. Lovely uh, introduction. And thanks to the organizers for, for having me here. So I'm going to do something that I, I don't think I've ever done before, which is to try and communicate uh, my science in this 10 minutes entirely by pictures and metaphors and analogies. I realize I don't have a clicker in my hand. Was that <laughs> intentional? But uh, I don't really need one, because if someone can uh, move the slides, then, aha, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this is all good. So we'll start with this, which is uh, when people have an experience with these remarkable compounds, psychedelics, they often, in fact, formally, I can speak to this, they rate their experiences consistently among the most unusual of their lives. So in a recent study, we did an entirely healthy, psychedelic, naive individuals who never had a psychedelic experience before in their lives, mean age of uh, about 40, so middle-aged, and we give them, gave them a high dose of uh, so-called magic mushrooms, um, psilocybin, and 95% of them, all but one, rated their experience as the single most unusual state of consciousness they've ever had in their life. So when people have these experiences that are as weird as that, they often don't know how to explain them. And it's quite common, as the name suggests, with magic mushrooms, that we might go to some kind of beyond the brain explanation, some kind of magical explanation. And it's just a simple principle. And I love the fact that we have this uh, event today called Brain Mind. Uh, you know, that in a sense, there's nothing missing. Uh, all, all mind stuff, in a sense, are at the same time on the other side of the coin, simultaneously brain stuff. Uh, there's a common code that unites them, and that's where I'm going to go next. So how do psychedelics work? Well, it's a simple principle to say, not by magic. Despite the name magic mushrooms, terrible joke, do not work via magic. Um, so how do they work? Well, this principle of the entropic brain is something I introduced um, in 2014. It's due another update. I did an update in 2018, but it's definitely due a something like a 10 years of the entropic brain. Entropy is a principle that most fundamentally is statistical. It means our uncertainty about any phenomenon. You could also say it's an index of the un unpredictability of a phenomenon, of a thing, of a system. So when we come in and sample, if that system is hard to predict, it's more entropic. So the principle I introduced was to say that the entropic experiential state the strange sort of chaotic state of being on a psychedelic could be explained by the strange chaotic quality of the ongoing brain activity. Very simple principle, but it seems to be holding up. We have found since that initial idea that uh, you can indeed index uh, the intensity of a psychedelic experience from the degree of entropy uh, induced in the brain when we sample ongoing um, electrical fields, and we've also found quite recently that that effect predicts things downstream. Uh, in fact, it predicts improvements in mental health outcomes that we see one month after giving psilocybin. Again, this is the study in people who were entirely naive to psychedelics. We gave them a single dose, recorded brain activity, saw the entropic brain effect. Those who had the biggest effect were those who improved most in their psychological well-being out at one month. So a mechanism there, not a magical one, something quite tangible. Now, I do think it's quite exciting that we could have a principle, yes, borrowed from physics, borrowed from statistics, that can at the same time speak to mind stuff, speak to experiential stuff, and at the same time speak to the quality through a quantitative index uh, of uh, the brain activity. A kind of Rosetta Stone, if you want, a kind of common code that unites brain and mind, brain-mind. Um, another principle, this time borrowed more from biology, uh, or rather evolutionary science rather than physics, is canalization. What is canalization? Well, it's got an interesting history. It actually goes back to the French philosopher Henri Bergson, where, a bit like what I'm trying to do today, he used analogy to speak to things, I suppose, in the universe, and the analogy was that of a canal things being rooted in a particular direction, entrenched in a particular direction. 
Now, in the context of evolutionary science, canalization is actually the inverse of plasticity, where plasticity, if you were to look it up in the dictionary, says the ability of a thing, a phenomenon, to be shaped or molded. So it's not the actual change, but it's the ability, the capacity to be changed. So for example, taking a metal here, heating it up, making it more plastic, making it more shapeable, that's a system that uh, now is becoming malleable, and in a sense, the inverse of, of canalization, which is, could be thought of as a resistance to change, like things getting stamped into your genome, so that from generation to generation, you know, generally speaking, we have two arms, uh, two legs, and so on. So phenotypes stamped into the organism, resistant to change, uh, is canalization. Its flip side is plasticity. Why am I focusing here? Because uh, last, in fact, it was this year, I introduced a theory of psychopathology, a theory of mental illness that emphasized canalization as a common principle. Ways of thinking and behaving that get too entrenched, too stamped in, too resistant to change, whether that's the negative cognitive biases in depression, the certain way that we look at ourselves in, in body image disorder, such as anorexia or body dysmorphic disorder, whether it's our habits of behavior that become stamped in in addictions, a lot of psychopathology, not all of it, but that's the point of a simple model that tries to capture a principal component. The main thing of uh, psychopathology of mental illness, I'm saying, is canalization, that, that excessive overweighting of certain ways of thinking and behaving. What's the solution? Well, I suggest it's this generalized plasticity increasing the ability to be shaped or molded, and that indeed is what psychedelics seem to do. Now, in terms of a model, it's all about models uh, with this talk today, but uh, uh, of how the brain and mind works very generally, arguably the dominant model that we have at the moment goes under a few different names. One might be the Bayesian brain, another one hierarchical predictive coding or processing. But the principle is quite simple. It's that we experience the world predominantly through our internal predictive models. And you might look at an image like this and hallucinate motion. It's not, in a sense, uh, um, well, it's, it's an example of your brain and mind working optimally, cutting corners if you want, smoothing or coarse graining your experience of the world because typically if you saw something like this which is static it would be moving and so that's the internal predictive model that's called up and you hallucinate that thing now throwing psychedelics in the mix as i did a couple of years ago with this rebus model relaxed beliefs under psychedelics the principle the idea the hypothesis was to say that the weighting of those internal predictive models whatever their models of, whether it's something perceptual like here or something higher level, like a model of who you are, your sense of self or ego, the weighting of those predictive models, the precision, if you want the confidence of those models, will be relaxed, it will be dialed down, and that's the action uh, of psychedelics. Now another metaphor, again, these are sort of um, mechanisms, processes that I'm trying to speak to here, borrowing from other uh, examples or, or cases in, in the world, in the universe, uh, is what's the nature of the thing that comes into experience? If so far I've told you about brain entropy and this relaxing of assumptions, if psychedelics, as the name suggests, the etymology of psychedelic means psyche revealing, making the psyche manifest. So what is the essence of that insight? And, you should know that insight experiences under psychedelics are strongly predictive, like the entropic brain effect of, in, of changes in mental health outcomes downstream. In the evidence that I'm alluding to, it's improvements in psychological well-being. So here, I was looking for something that would capture things coming up. You know, what is that in nature? What is that in physics? And well, you know, evaporation or vaporization is part of that stuff coming up from a main body, evaporating up, becoming more entropic. There's another thing I've missed, I've realized since creating this slide, which is the condensation aspect, which is what happens when things crystallize. They get heat, heated up into the entropic state, 
then they cool down and condense, for example, into a cloud, into a form. And that process, which is somewhat analogous to uh, annealing in metallurgy, you know, I showed that image of plasticity with the metal being heated up, made more plastic, made more malleable. It cools down into some specific form. Here, the idea is that you introduce heat into the system, energy into the system, entropy into the system, the system becomes more unpredictable, then it's gonna cool down and some of the surface imperfections that were, were in that system, like examples of things getting you know, beaten into shape, like a canalization, the surface imperfections, with the process of heating and then cooling, there'll be a smoothing of that system. So the final principle I'll leave you with is this one of psychedelic therapy when we apply these drugs in a therapeutic context, that combination uh, promoting, in a sense, a recalibration of a mind that has become canalized in psychopathology, like becoming an expert, in a sense, in your illness, over rehearsed, getting stuck in that depression, like a literal depression, heat the system, introduce that entropy, it cools down, it smooths, it's recalibrated, it's reset. So that's the mechanistic model that I've been using for um, the action of psychedelic therapy for psychopathology. Now, I didn't show any charts, I didn't show any brains, but it would be remiss of me not to give some citations. So if any of this has been interesting to you, I'd encourage you to look up these papers, perhaps particularly the last one there that tries to encapsulate it all. So thank you very much for your attention.